Good morning to everyone and uh, welcome to the second day of our uh, Brexit Institute conference on the framework of new EU-UK uh, relations. Uh, after an intense afternoon, uh, we are delighted to continue our uh, conversation uh, today with uh, three additional panels uh, focusing on the trade and cooperation agreements uh, and other issues related to EU-UK uh, relations. Uh, I want to remind uh, everyone from a housekeeping perspective that we are recording uh, this um, webinar so as to make it later available on the Brexit Institute uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and as you know, uh, there will be a time and space for a question and answer after the paper presentation. And to do that, uh, you can either raise your hand uh, or uh, directly uh, send your uh, question uh, to the chair, uh, Paddy Smith from uh, the Irish Time, who I want to warmly thank for accepting to chair this, uh, this morning panel. Uh, and without further ado, I'll hand him the floor. Thank you, Paddy. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Federico, um, and, and welcome to this session. I, I'm just going to say a couple of words uh, about the, the, the scope of the discussion. Um, Theresa May once said that uh, Europe's security is our security. Um, but inevitably, the relationship on, on the, the, the agreement on the future relationship has curtailed that somewhat. Um, and what we're really going to be looking at is how damaging that has been to uh, the integration of the UK into European security structures and policies. And um, there, the, and perhaps look at, 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 at how much there is still to um, resolve in, in this thing. In particular, I'm thinking of, of the adequacy decision which is expected from the Commission about data, uh, data sharing. And, and I'm, I, as I understand it, the, the arrangements for participation in PAS, PESCO are still e evolving. Um, and I should just point out that uh, overnight we've seen uh, that uh, treaty, which is going to define uh, the relationship in the security area, put in jeopardy because European parliamentarians have decided that they're not going to vote on it. Uh, um, as they had planned, so its its temporary ratification is put is going to be put on hold, and and we are in danger of seeing the treaty uh, lapse because it is due if it isn't ratified by uh, the end of April, uh, the the treaty is, is gone. But anyway, maybe our, our speakers can can touch on on uh, that issue. I might first ask um, Ben uh, Tonra from UCD. Uh, to talk about the defence and security uh, cooperation. Thanks very much, Paddy, and thank you very much to Federico and uh, and the team there at DCU for for pulling this project together in in such an exemplary way. Uh, and I hope we can maintain yesterday's terrific momentum uh, from from the opening panels. So this morning, I am starting by presenting you with something of a of a cuckoo paper, um, and I say cuckoo paper because this is a paper about something that didn't appear in the final trade and cooperation agreement. And uh, while at first sight this may appear somewhat redundant, I do hope to show over the course of the next 15 minutes or so that the absence of any agreement uh, on a framework for foreign policy and defense cooperation does actually tell us something uh, about the nature of Brexit uh, and indeed about the, the, the UK-EU relationship uh, into the future. So first, of course, a, a note on context, <clears throat> and I think we, we should always remind ourselves when, when looking at European defence and security policy cooperation, that the UK is absolutely central to European security and defence. As a leading uh, member of NATO, uh, embedded deeply uh, bilaterally with most European states on, on defence issues, uh, with a serious expeditionary and military capacity of its own, with a large domestic defence industry, the largest defence budget in Europe, um, and notably, we should also uh, remind ourselves that the U UK, alongside France, was the co-creator uh, of the Union's own common security and defence policy. We would have no common security and defence policy had it not been for the UK uh, and that seminal agreement in Saint-Malo in, uh, in 1999, which would set the, the framework of the possibility uh, for what was described at, as an autonomous uh, security and defence capacity in Europe. Of course, we also have to remind ourselves that the UK is, is a determined Atlanticist uh, and while um, uh, ha has, has always uh, fought, if you like, for NATO primacy in terms of security defence, even as it accepted the development of this autonomous European capacity. Um, 
when we look specifically then at Brexit, uh, we also need to remind ourselves that, that, that defence was not a big issue in the Brexit debate. We, we did have some, some marginal claims along the side of, the, of, of, of UK politics, uh, talk about a European army, which we're familiar with in this state, uh, but none of that had real substance and didn't seem to really grip uh, the public imagination in terms of that debate. But the result of that, and particularly the result of, of UK officials and even European officials looking over their shoulder at domestic political conversations in the UK, it did have a chilling factor on the development of the common security defense policy. So you had both the UK's own Atlanticist orientation and wielding of vetoes in, in the formal sense, uh, retarding some developments in CSDP. But I think even more important, you had the chilling effect uh, of member states and EU institutions sort of censoring themselves for fear that they would feed into the emerging de Brexit debate from, from about 2015 onwards. Um, and, and there was definitely then this sense that the UK was a, was a break on the development of the common security defense policy. So then when we come to looking specifically at the, the trade and cooperation agreement, I think we definitely see this in terms of, of a game of two halves. Um, and those of you that, that, that know me will note that uh, my using a sporting metaphor in any context um, is, is dripping with irony. But nonetheless, I think the metaphor is, is actually quite useful. Um, so we look first at the, at the first half of this, of, of this game. With that referendum decision in 2016, um, it is notable that both the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Defence in the UK went to extraordinary lengths to reassure partners across Europe that the UK's dedication and commitment to European security was unabridged uh, and, 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 and would be maintained. Um, there are stories indeed of, of, of officials you know, telephoning through the night uh, on, the day, on, the, on the day of the referendum result to foreign ministries and defence ministries across Europe, giving precisely that, that reassurance that the UK's commitment to European defence would not be, would not be uh, abridged. But there was a counterintuitive effect in Brussels as a result of that vote in 2016. Uh, as you re re will recall, the Union's global strategy was published just days after the referendum result. Uh, and Federica Mogherini, as the, as the HRVP at the time, actually rejected advice to postpone its publication so as to allow for reflection on the, on the Brexit result. In fact, she actually doubled down specifically on security defense as a means of reinforcing uh, Europe's global commitment to underlining Europe's uh, integrative and, and cooperative dynamic. Um, and what we have seen since uh, in terms of the development of PESCO, the coordinated annual review on, on defense, uh, the European Defense Fund, etc. You know, none of that would have happened with the UK at the table, uh, and the U and the and the European Union, as I say, almost counterintuitively, doubled down on security and defense as a means of of reinforcing integrative dynamics within the European Union. When we then turn to what was the UK's opening position on defense and security cooperation uh, in the European in the in the bilateral relationship uh, for the future. The initial papers that the UK published in 2017 uh, included a paper dedicated just to defense. Um, and if you, if you go back and read it, it's, it's quite extraordinary. It's, it's been characterized as a, as a love letter uh, to the European Union. So fulsome was this paper in, in terms of what it, what it promised and what it said about the pen, potential for EU-UK cooperation in this, in this field. Um, a couple of, of, of my colleagues who fancied themselves as, as wits even said it was it was more pro, it was more pro EU than the UK had been as an EU member. Um, so looking at that paper, as I say, does does give you a reminder of, of the starting point uh, for the UK. Um, but it's important to note here that there was that, that both sides saw both the UK and the EU side saw defence as the strongest card in the UK's negotiating hand. Um, this, this fought a very odd dynamic, a, fed a, a very odd dynamic in, in the negotiations, because the UK began, based on the sem September 2017 uh, paper, the UK began to demand very imaginative and creative links between the EU and the UK on foreign security policy. Um, this even included a demand at one point, or at least a suggestion at one point, that the UK could retain its seat on the Foreign Affairs Council. I mean, that's how ambitious, how committed uh, the UK initially was in terms of what it saw as its level of ambition. For the European Union side, however, this I think raised some red flags and some concerns because for the European Union uh, to feed UK exceptionalism 
in the area of defense was seen as a danger, was seen as a, a, an area of concern. The, the European Union was determined, as it had to be, was determined to protect the rights and responsibilities of its members uh, in the area of security and defense and could not allow itself to offer extraordinary exceptional mem uh, 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 attributes to a departing uh, member state. Um, and I think what they feared, therefore, was, was the creation of a dangerous beachhead of exceptionalism for the UK in the area of security and defense. Um, and notwithstanding this, the UK continued to press for more imaginative and creative responses. Um, I think the European side was open to being creative and was open to, to, to doing it the most it could within this treaty framework to accommodate the UK. Um, but it, it repeatedly came back to this point that third country status had implications and that those implications had to be accepted uh, on the UK side. So the UK access to EU programs, policies and structures had to be limited by this, by this protection of the rights of exist existing member states. Um, in fact, we even have the episode of, of Cyprus uh, requesting of the, of the Council Legal Services a clarification uh, of, quite, of some quite woolly text um, that promised you know, special cooperation and special arrangements with the UK because Cyprus was anxious that the, that the European Union institutions were offering potentially too much uh, to the UK, which would compromise the, the inherent rights of member states. So at the end of, of half time, if you like, what, what were we looking at? What we were looking at at the end of half time as a result of the negotiations on the withdrawal agreement and as a result of the, the political declaration of October 2019 was quite an ambitious framework on paper that clearly had yet to be fleshed out, but, but clearly set the targets to be very high. It offered a skeleton of, of, of a defense relationship that was founded on shared ambition to work together to safeguard the rules-based international order, the rule of law, and the promotion of democracy. It encompassed a dedicated chapter on foreign policy, security, defense, which sought to create an ambitious, close, and lasting framework of cooperation while noting the limitation on the parties' respective legal orders. But it was a framework that held out the prospect of quite a degree of ambition. None of that came to pass. None of that came to pass. So in the second half, what are we seeing in these negotiations? In the second half, what we see, of course, we have to acknowledge at the, at the, at the start, we've got a new captain and a new coaching team on the UK side. Uh, the victory of Boris Johnson in the Conservative leadership contest that summer and his subsequent general election victory in December 2019 totally overturned previous assumptions, particularly on the European, but also on the UK side. Johnson had, of course, campaigned on a theme of, of getting Brexit done, and he brought into Downing Street a, an entirely new cabinet, team of advisors and officials who were all explicitly dedicated to the Brexit project. Many of them, as you know, had been at the center of the Leave campaign itself. Those that had supported, those that had drafted, those that had negotiated uh, Theresa May's withdrawal agreement and its associated protocol with this ambitious framework for defense cooperation were either sidelined or sacked. What we saw then on the field to play was it was a total shift in strategy on the UK side. And I want to give you a sense of what I perceive to have been the assessment from, from London side. And we might explore this, it, it's, its credibility in the, in the Q&A afterwards. Um, I think the first thing to, to, to bear in mind here is that the UK made a fundamental reappraisal of, of what was possible in the area of foreign security and defense policy. Um, and their first assessment really was that the, the EU offered them very little added value. The EU offered little beyond what the, EU, what the UK could achieve through NATO, through other multilateral and bilateral frameworks. So there was not much the EU could put on the table as far as the British government was concerned. Secondly, I think there was an assessment on the UK side, and again, we can take this up in the Q&A, um, is that the UK saw the, the European Union as being reluctant to push the envelope. They didn't see a level of ambition coming back from, from, from Brussels that they thought, again, would deliver much beyond a bog standard third state relationship uh, with the European Union. By contrast, the UK negotiators were making huge demands of the EU in terms of exceptionalism across the whole trade spectrum. So from a UK perspective, my conclusion is that the UK saw little actual added value to their devoting any time, effort, energy, or resources in trying to secure a an agreement on defense. 
Um, they simply didn't see the return being provided. And I think the further calculation was that not having an agreement on defense would have marginal impact on the UK, whereas no agreement on the trade agenda would have massive impact on the UK. So in effect, my conclusion is the UK simply jettisoned defense as an agenda item for their negotiations. Now, now this you know, was, was greeted with, with puzzlement, amusement, and, and, and stunned, I think, some, some EU interlocutors. Um, because in, in all that the European Union heard from their, from their UK negotiators was deafening silence. The UK simply opted out of any conversation on defense. And the UK opted out of that conversation on defence, not least because of the whole global Britain um, um, policy, the global, the global Britain foreign policy orientation. Now, we can have a whole other conversation about the credibility, the legitimacy, uh, the reality of the global Britain framework. But the critical thing to bear in mind, again, looking at this through the, through, through the eyes of London, is that this necessitates a profound de-Europeanisation of British foreign security and defense policy. Because the whole notion of global Britain was oriented around both the Anglophone world, the democratic world, the Commonwealth, the special relationship with the US, the seat on the UN Security Council. It almost necessitated, as I say, this de-Europeanization, this driving away from the European Union on foreign security and defense policy. So what are we left with? I think it's important to note that the UK is pressing ahead with an ambitious agenda on defence. Uh, we've seen massive budget increase in the UK promised uh, from, the, from, the, from the Johnson government. We've seen the UK pursuing a multitude of initiatives at the bilateral and minilateral level. Um, I think it's very, very striking that President Macron of France is providing significant cover for the UK in this, in this respect. He is enabling uh, this narrative in the UK through the uh, through the, um, um, the 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 European Security Council proposal through the European Intervention Initiative, he is providing the UK with the means necessary for the UK to retain a leading position in European security and defence. Um, so we're left with the reality that while both partners would profit from cooperation in security, defence, and foreign policy, neither side, most especially the UK for largely domestic political reasons, can countenance the political and institutional costs that are necessary to give such cooperation any institutional foundation. But if I end on a hopeful note, having, having laid out a very, a very negative scenario, ending on a hopeful note is to watch what happens with Biden in the US. Um, we heard a little bit about this from, from Mick Cox yesterday, and we might develop this again in, in the Q&A subsequently. Um, but we had just yesterday, um, you know, reports that the U.S. was buying into third country participation in PESCO. We also saw the, the, the sanctions uh, uh, coordinated at a certain level between the U.S., Canada, and the EU towards uh, Russia over the Navalny issue. It would be striking indeed if it was the United States that provides the cover and the capacity for the U.K. to re-engage with EU security and defense. Um, and that, as I say, is the, is the only bright spark in an otherwise pretty dark chapter in the negotiations. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, Ben. And, and now I, I hand the floor to Eduardo Celeste of DCU, who's going to talk about uh, data and, and the law. Thank you very much, Paddy, for your introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks also to the Brexit Institute and uh, its director, Federico Fabrini, for organizing this event. So as Paddy said, I will focus my presentation on uh, data protection, uh, structuring my uh, paper into uh, four main parts. Uh, I will first uh, uh, analyze uh, the relevance of the data protection question in the Brexit negotiations. I will then move uh, uh, into and analyze the provisions of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, 
that has been signed on Christmas Eve 2020. And in particular, I will focus on the new transitional period and its relation with data protection. In the third part of my presentation, I will then focus on the prospect of a new adequacy decision related to the UK. And I will then uh, conclude uh, by arguing that Brexit from a data protection perspective represents a, a step backwards. And I explain, I will explain why. So the data, protect, data protection question uh, was crucial in the, uh, during the negotiation process. Uh, many authors argued that data protection had the potential to uh, make or break a po possibly successful Brexit. Why? Because essentially the decision of the UK of leaving the EU and the, the European economic area determines the end of an area of an hindered flow of personal data between the EU and the UK. However, the EU at the same time represents the first UK trading partner and UK stock businesses are mainly in the services and the financial sector and almost half of the European large digital companies over the past few years have emerged in the UK. So we can perfectly understand that all these financial and economic considerations are linked to the data protection issue. All these businesses and industry heavily rely on data exchange and a a non-orderly departure of the uh, UK from the EU would have determined the a sudden halt of the data exchange between uh, the EU and the UK. And leaving aside just for a second the commercial sector, we also have to remind uh, that uh, the data exchange is extremely important also from a law enforcement and intelligence perspective. Uh, as Ben has uh, just highlighted in his presentation, the UK was one of the main partners, uh, if not the founders of many initiatives, uh, uh, cooperation in this sector at EU level. So also from a law enforcement and intelligence perspective, uh, a sudden halt of uh, data exchange would have represented uh, a very, would have determined very serious uh, consequences uh, uh, for a uh, smooth uh, uh, functioning uh, of these uh, uh, sectors. During the negotiation process, uh, UK data protection law significantly evolved, both for factors which were related to a sort of like a natural evolution of EU data protection law and for factors which were more uh, um, related to the Brexit process itself. So first of all, in 2018, uh, the UK introduced, incorporated the GDPR into uh, national law, uh, adopting the Data Protection Act 2018, which uh, derogates, introduces a series of derogations to the GDPR and implements uh, the uh, law enforcement directive. In 2018, the UK also passed the European Union Withdrawal Act, which is very important from a data protection perspective because this piece of legislation establishes which pieces of EU legislation will be retained after exit day. And the, this piece of legislation establishes that among the retained EU law will be pieces of legislation with direct effect therefore including the GDPR. Lastly, in 2019, the UK passed the Data Protection, Privacy and Electronic Communications EU exit regulations, which is a very important piece of regulation because it explains how retained EU law will be complemented by new UK law in the field of data protection. And in particular, the UK has decided to maintain its own version of the GDPR called UK GDPR, and uh, also to maintain uh, the uh, implementation of the law enforcement directive. 
Um, to this extent, it's very important to remind that, that the UK version of the GDPR has also maintained a provision um, providing for an extraterritorial scope of application, which essentially means that the UK and the, the EU version of the GDPR will overlap in terms of a, a scope of application from a data protection perspective. On Christmas Eve 2020, the, both sides, the EU and the UK, uh, signed the, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which is a very unusual type of agreement because it introduces a series of trade barriers instead of eliminating them. Title three of the uh, TCA focuses on digital trade. Both parties, of course, commit to ensure uh, a, an inter data flows between uh, uh, across the channel. Uh, they both commit to um, avoid the imposition of data localization requirements uh, to protect, uh, continue protecting the right to data protection and privacy to enhance uh, trust. And they both state that they will be uh, free to uh, independently design their legal framework. A statement that I will explain in my next slides uh, uh, will probably remain on paper uh, for uh, the UK. Part three of the TCA uh, focuses on the law enforcement and judicial cooperation. And here we find very interesting provisions related to uh, the data protection aspect. Indeed, uh, the UK will no longer maintain a direct and real time access to uh, DNA, DNA profiles, fingerprints, vehicle registration numbers, and PNRs. However, a series of cooperation frameworks will be established. Indeed, the UK will no longer participate in the works of Europol and Eurojust and will not maintain a direct access to the Schengen information system. Paradoxically, the main uh, data protection question, which was the one of the uh, flows of personal data between Europe and the UK, is not regulated in the core part of the TCA. It's relegated in its final provisions. Uh, Article 10A of the uh, final provisions of the TCA provides for a, a new transitional period of six months during which the EU Commission will have the opportunity to adopt an adequacy determination in relation to the UK. What is extremely interesting is that in the meantime, the UK will not be considered as a third country and therefore a, a, a free flow of personal data between the two parties will be maintained. However, the EU imposed a series of conditions to grant uh, this uh, favor uh, to the UK. The first condition is that the UK will not have the opportunity to substantially amend its data protection framework, will only have to limit itself to operate a sort of ordinary maintenance, or otherwise will have to ask for a prior approval uh, from the Partnership Council. So we can understand that at least during the transition period, the expected divorce of UK data protection law from EU law remains only on paper. Now, uh, from January 2021, therefore a new transitional period in relation to data protection has uh, started. The EU Commission has indeed six months in total to adopt an adequacy determination. And we have just seen that uh, on the 19th of February, the EU Commission has uh, published two uh, draft adequacy decision, one in relation to commercial data transfer and one in relation to data transfer for law enforcement purposes. So now the procedure is that these two draft adequacy determination will be analyzed and assessed by the European Data Protection Board and will have to be a subject to the uh, classical comitology procedure, therefore be approved by the majority of the EU member states. So paradoxically, adopting an adequacy determination in relation to the UK is not a very straightforward task, despite the, the formal membership of the UK 
uh, to the EU. Indeed, uh, Article 45 of the GDPR requires the Commission to operate a comprehensive assessment of the legal system of the third country, therefore including uh, paradoxically aspects uh, such as uh, national security law, which were not formerly falling within the scope of EU law. Until a very important case, the so-called Schrems one decided by the European Court of Justice in 2015, there was this sort of widespread belief that an adequacy decision implied a sort of unatantum analysis of the foreign legal system, that adequacy decisions were somehow set in stone. However, the European Court of Justice clarified that this is not the case. Adequacy determinations are not set in stone, but are subject to regular updates. And this essentially means that an adequacy determination will never represent a sort of only only oxen free for the UK. The UK indeed will never have the possibility to operate significant amendments to data reduction law, we'll have to pay attention to maintain a, a national security legislation more or less in line with the EU one, because the risk is, uh, of course, uh, the risk of losing inadequacy determination. So paradoxically, I argue that, that um, very much awaited um, prospect of emancipation from EU law, from a data protection perspective, will never be achieved due to this fear of losing the adequacy status. And this is not pure academic speculation, it occurred in the past in the relation to the US, which, was, uh, the, which is uh, the main commercial partner of the uh, EU. Uh, both in uh, 2015 and more recently last summer in 2020, the two uh, mechanisms that the EU Commission put in place to ensure free flow of data between the EU and the US were invalidated by the European Court of Justice. My second point, my second argument in relation to the adequacy decision is that it will represent a very precarious solution. Indeed, notwithstanding all the reassuring statements that have been made by the EU Commission um, recently in uh, the occasion of the publication of the draft adequacy decision, uh, EU Commissioner have uh, affirmed that the UK, of course, will continue to belong to the same EU privacy family. If we read uh, the, uh, the draft adequacy decision, it includes very interesting uh, uh, footnotes uh, uh, stating that the most uh, doubtful provision of uh, UK data protection law in reality do not apply to data transferred from the EU. But in reality, we have to remember that this is not sufficient because an adequacy determination implies a comprehensive assessment of the foreign legal system. So it doesn't matter if we argue that certain provision will not, in theory, apply to data transferred from the EU. And the recent case law from the European Court of Justice, in my opinion, has uh, um, spoken in very clear terms uh, in, uh, in relation to the inadequacy of the current uh, UK national security law from a data protection perspective. We can remember the 2016 TD2 and Watson case where the UK data retention regime uh, was considered not in line with EU law. Of course, uh, we can mention the more recent uh, Privacy International case uh, decided in uh, October 2020, which once again reiterate that a general and indiscriminate retention of metadata, which is performed by UK law enforcement authority, is not in line with EU fundamental rights. I've already mentioned the Schrems 1 and, and Schrems 2 cases, which yes, they refer to uh, the US legal system, but at the same time, we have to remember that there is a strong linkage between UK and US in terms of intelligence cooperation. And there is a pending case before the European Court of Human Rights in the Big Brother uh, Watch, uh, initiated by the Big Brother Watch uh, NGO. So in my opinion, the uh, adequacy, a potential adequacy determination would be subject to a sort of a time bomb. So it's only a question of time that would be challenged again before the European Court of Justice, if adopted by the Commission. 
Therefore, my conclusion is that Brexit, from a data protection perspective, uh, represents a step backwards. So first of all, because it increases the level of complexity from a, in terms of a EU, UK data protection framework, because of the presence of a, the simultaneous presence of two provisions uh, providing for the extraterritorial application of respectively EU and UK data protection law. Secondly, because the TCA introduced, uh, instead of uh, eliminating barriers to the free flow of personal data. Thirdly, because Brexit did not achieve the much expected uh, uh, outcome of emancipating uh, EU data protection, um, UK data protection law from EU data protection law. And fourthly, because uh, national security, a sector which was uh, previously falling outside the scope of EU law is paradoxically now put in the spotlight uh, and is, uh, the, the element which it will really be determining now in understanding, in evaluating whether the UK will deserve an adequacy determination or not. And in conclusion, I also think that an adequacy decision from the EU Commission will also represent a very unstable and precarious uh, a legal mechanism for transferring data from the EU to the UK. Many thanks for your attention. Then I will very much welcome uh, uh, questions and comments uh, now in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Ed, uh, thanks, Eduardo. And we now move on uh, to the Q&A. And perhaps I'll just throw in a, a question to uh, ben about um, CFSP. I, I just to start the ball rolling. I, I wondered what to what extent you can actually already see the beginning of a drift apart from uh, British uh, CFSP, uh, British uh, attitudes to CFSP issues and and uh, European uh, Union ones. Um, I, I know it's been manifest, for example, in the in the uh, EU decisions about Turkey and the drilling in, in the Mediterranean, with the British refusing to uh, adopt a, a strict line with the Turks about the, um, about the drilling, because apparently they want a trade deal with uh, Turkey. Um, and I, I was wondering well, what other areas you can see uh, differences, practical differences are, are, are emerging. Um, I, China, for example, is, is there a material difference there? I think, we, I think we have indeed already seen some, some of that. I mean, I think I think from, again, from, from London's perspective, you know, being outside the, the policy structures of CFSB gives, gives greater flexibility, more nimbleness, they can act more quickly. Um, we saw, I thought, uh, you know, a, a very big move on, on Hong Kong uh, and the offer of residency to those with BNO passports. I thought that was a, that was a big and a, a very bold move on the part of the UK. Of course, the, <clears throat> the European Union always faces its own problems in terms of things like sanctions with respect to vetoes inside. We saw the the, uh, the, the, the difficulty over agreeing sanctions towards Belarus. So again, the UK got in there earlier and quicker uh, with their own set of national sanctions. I think, I think economic sanctions in particular is an area where the UK is, is trying to develop a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of moxie, a little bit of credibility. Um, <clears throat> but I think what we see with the Navalny uh, instance is, is, is a case of the reverse, where the UK is, is a bit on the back foot. I'm not entirely sure why they've been slow on the sanctions front with respect to Navalny. I'm not sure why they've allowed themselves to fall in that position, but, but those are the kinds of areas I think we're seeing the greatest level of divergence. We should always remember, of course, that the commonality of both strategic position in terms of threat perception, in terms of capacity, there's still a huge amount that binds Europe together. Um, but I think at the margins here, particularly in the area of sanctions, we're gonna see some movement and some significant divergence. Thanks. I, I'd ask Catherine uh, maybe to look and see uh, what questions are coming in on the thing. My, my screen seems to have frozen the question uh, box. Hello? Adi, I might ask a question myself, if I may. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so it is really for Eduardo, and it, and, it, and it is a legal question in a sense uh, about this transition beyond the transition, uh, which I think is uh, to some extent a defining feature of Brexit. We are keeping extending, transitioning, having bridging periods, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, in the case of data protection, uh, this is quite extraordinary. So there is 
uh, of course, during the transition period under the withdrawal agreement, the GDPR fully applied. Then on the 31st of December, the transition period formally ended. Uh, and yet the trade and cooperation agreement created a new transition period for six months, uh, during which the uh, European Commission will adopt an adequacy decision. Now, the legal question is, as, as Paddy was explaining at the beginning uh, uh, this morning, the, the European Parliament has uh, suspended for now the process of uh, approval and ratification uh, of the TCA. Uh, so my question to you is, what, uh, what would be the consequences of a non-ratification of the TCA for data protection? Now, of course, de facto, uh, the, the TCA is, uh, is currently uh, applied provisionally, uh, and we do have a draft adequacy decision by the Commission uh, from late February. But uh, is there a chance this will uh, really be approved before the end of April, which is currently the end date for the provisional application of the TCA. Uh, and, uh, you know, if the TCA is not, uh, again, approved or rolled over or whatever, uh, what is going to happen for, uh, for data protection? Are we going to go through a cliff edge effectively at some point? Yes, thank you very much, Federico. So you, you raised very, very important points from a data protection perspective. Uh, so I will limit myself to two main remarks. Uh, so first of all, I would say I would like to highlight the complexity of this uh, transition within a transition from a data production perspective, uh, which was not probably very uh, apparent from my presentation. I would like to stress the fact that the new transitional period that they started on uh, January the 1st, uh, 2021, only relates to the uh, data transfer aspect uh, of data protection. So paradoxically, the uh, TCA has uh, frozen the status quo of the relations between the EU and the UK only in relation to the provisions related to data transfer, which essentially means that from uh, the 1st of January, the UK has a different set of rules in relation to data protection. So they have the so-called UK GDPR, which applies independently from the EU GDPR. Therefore, all the other set of provisions, such as, for example, the obligation for data controllers, uh, which are established in another jurisdiction to appoint, uh, for example, a representative, uh, will be valid both from the UK and the EU side. What is really interesting is that the TCA introduced a specific transitional agreement for this uh, very specific question, which is the question of data transfer. So the new transitional period only relates to the data transfer. And then my second remark is related to your observation and to the recent decision of the EU Parliament of suspending uh, the ratification of the TCA. It's extremely interesting to notice that paradoxically, if the EU Commission will manage to adopt an adequacy determination in the meantime, this will be uh, a procedure completely independent from the ratification of the TCA, because the TCA didn't introduce any particular or new mechanism to ensure the free flow of personal data. The so-called adequacy decision or determination is a mechanism that was already uh, foreseen by the Data Protection Directive that has been inherited by the GDPR. So paradoxically, the EU Commission will uh, continue to be to have the power to adopt an adequacy determination irrespective of the ratification of the TCA or not. What may happen, conversely, is that if, um, the, if the EU Parliament um, decides not to ratify the TCA, it will probably open a sort of like a new, new transitional phase within the transitional phase, in which essentially there, there might be a gap uh, until the EU Commission will adopt an adequate decision. And during this gap, we'll have a very, very serious consequences because essentially the UK will be deprived of a mechanism of, for, to transfer data from the EU to the UK. Right. Are there any other questions? 
there is a question. Th thanks, Eduardo. There is a question from John Doyle to Ben Tonrap. I, I think I'll just activate the audio, John's audio, if I can. Uh, ben, I just that's a question in terms of, um, you spoke a lot about the potential negative impacts, um, but my Brexit also, uh, in some ways, forced the remaining EU27 to take CSTP a little bit more seriously, and perhaps might we see a greater use of instruments under CSTP or deployment of missions to show that they do have some collective capacity in the space? I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's a good question, and, and, and it is exemplified by the fact that we have seen some extraordinary progress in the area of CSDP as, res, as a direct result of Brexit. As I say, you know, removing both the chill factor of, of, of UK Atlanticism and removing the UK veto has allowed the European Union to do a lot in terms of institutional development. But I think that's also, and, and you know, others, others on this, at this conference will, may, may, may agree on this, you know, the, U, the European Union is very adept at institutional tinkering and developing programs and developing policies and developing structures where we seem to fall down and what is our, our underlying weakness is the political will to deploy, the political will to use. Um, and I, to be frank, John, I haven't seen as of yet any real shift in that level of political will to actually deploy, to use the kinds of instruments that are at the Union's disposal. Um, we have now, I think the game changer for me is, is in the area of the European Defence Fund, um, upwards of 7.2 billion euro, which is directed at investments in defence technology, research uh, and investment. Um, I think that does create a center of gravity, not just for the, for the UK, but more broadly for the European Union to do some serious things in terms of capacity development that have been lacking on the European front for some time. Um, if we see that move, if we see that develop, and the European Union actually develops the on-the-ground capacity, we may then see, alongside initiatives like this new strategic compass, we may now see the development of, of additional political will. But Again, you're dealing with 27 member states with 27 geographies, 27 histories, 27 different sets of uh, set threat perceptions. It's very, very difficult to craft that into anything like an executive and decisive foreign policy and defense security actor. Anybody else? Can, can I maybe follow up uh, with a question myself, uh, Paddy to Ben? Uh, just, a, just an, an add-on to the exchange with uh, with John right now, because I think, I mean, you and I have discussed this on the basis of draft of, of your chapter. It, it is somehow ironic because the UK, when it was in, was mostly an obstacle to the development of common foreign and security policy. Uh, it certainly, as you said, did did have the capacity and all of that, but the, the mindset at the same time, as you pointed out, was very much uh, against... Uh, pushing in favor of European developments uh, in those areas because of NATO, because of the special relationship with the United States. And now, at the same time, the UK has left and we are a little bit complaining within the EU that they are no longer there. <laughs> uh, so I suppose two questions is, I mean, if, if you think P PESCO, it's weak now, but at, at, at least we have it. So could that be called as a net dividend, really, of, 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 of Brexit? And could that be something that develops over time, uh, potentially becoming something relevant in connection with the defense fund uh, of which you've been talking about, etc.? cetera? And, and uh, actually, partially connected to that, I, I mean, not least given your nationality, what about Ireland in all of this? Uh, because clearly Ireland has a bit of a special... Um, connection with uh, CFSP and, and the European defense policy because it's, it's of its neutrality status and uh, not participation in, uh, in NATO. Uh, and I wonder, could actually the fact that the UK is out of the EU and out of this military operation, uh, in fact, make it easier for a nation like Ireland uh, to become more engaged? I suspect, I mean, I'm not an expert, but so I might be totally wrong, but I suspect one of the strong arguments why Ireland was not very pleased of being in NATO is because of its uh, difficult relationship with the UK uh, and all of that. But uh, the, the EU at 27 without the UK might be a totally different uh, sort of framework uh, for uh, the uh, in involvement of, uh, of Ireland defense forces uh, in integration. Yeah, <laughs> thanks Federico. I think, <clears throat> I think yes, there are dividends from, 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 from Brexit and, and PESCO certainly is one of them. I think. I think the criticism that, that many people have leveled at PESCO is it's, it's too scattergun, it's too broad, it's too shallow. Um, we've got upwards now of 47 different projects 
uh, some of which are, are simply dead on arrival. There's just nothing happening. Some have real, real potential, uh, but we haven't put the resources behind them to, to, to bring them to reality. Um, so I think there is, there is potential there. Um, I think in a sense, and, and here I'll, I'll turn the question back on you a little bit, you know, for so long in, in Europe, we, we claimed, or, or many people claim, well, we couldn't do things because of the UK, because of the UK veto, because of Atlanticism, you know, if only we could get the UK on side, what wonders we could, what wonders we could wield on the world stage. Well, now the UK's out, the veto's gone, the Atlanticist chill factor has been, has been diminished. It's, it, you know, there's still a strong Atlanticist constituency, but still, you know, we are unable to come up with, with, a, with a decent set of sanctions with respect to Belarus, because Cyprus is having difficulties and is, and is feeling unsupported by its EU26 partners. So, you know, the same, the same things that were holding us back before still hold us back. Uh, and the UK's departure, while it has allowed a lot of institutional tinkering that the UK always said, you know, didn't deliver boots on the ground, the UK was right. We've had lots of institutional tinkering, programs, policies, structures, institutions, etc. developed, but we still can't agree a set of sanctions uh, in the case of egregious human rights abuses in, in, in Belarus. So, as I say, there, there are certain European realities we still have to we still have to deal with. On your second question, dear Lord, where would I start? Ireland, Ireland, Anne. The short answer, I think, is no. Um, the short answer, I think, is is that that was the factor. You know, when when we initially said we wouldn't join the talks that led to the Washington Treaty in 1949, this was, of course, you know, the the, the excuse or the the rationale that Sean McBride gave. You know, we can't join NATO because NATO guarantees the borders of its member states. We couldn't possibly guarantee a border with which we with which we disagree. I think the conversation about neutrality has developed since. I think now in Ireland there's a very strong pacifist orientation to, 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 to those who subscribe to a neutrality narrative. I think there's a lot of, of, of if, if not at least ambiguity, um, certainly some antagonism towards being on the side of some of the large post-colonial European powers, you know, looking at what France, France's aspirations in North Africa, for example, even specifically what France, you know, French policy with respect to Mali at the moment. I think all of that complicates Ireland's engagement. Uh, with CFSP, CSDP. Um, I do see, and I come back to the point, I do see a lot of potential in the European Defence Fund. I think there is something that, you know, immediately impinges on the interests of Irish SMEs, Irish employment, Irish investment, Irish high-tech industry. Um, and yet, we still haven't got our act together on that. You know, we still don't have a system that allows us to, to, to provide a national security clearance to individuals to participate in defence projects. Uh, we still have restrictions on what Enterprise Ireland can do in the area of, of defence industry. We still don't have any kind of an association for SMEs in Ireland in this space. So, you know, even when there's money on the table, there's still ambivalence. Um, and though I think you're right that the removal of the UK might make things on, on the face of it more easy, of course, we still have to talk about a bilateral defence relationship with the UK itself. You know, we do have a de facto uh, a situation where the UK is guaranteeing Ireland's air security because we don't have the capacity, we don't have the radar, we don't have the anti-missile, we don't have the aircraft to defend our own airspace. So we effectively, if not formally, informally subcontract that to the UK. Um, that perhaps is the more difficult, uh, more difficult thing now. Now we need to think about the bilateral MOU we have with the UK on defence and whether we actually need to give that a little bit more substance than we have to date. Yeah. Um, th thanks, thanks, Ben. I mean, I, I'm struck too in in the context of what you've been talking about about the con the criticism of of institutional inertia, uh, which has come from the uh, UK about the European Union. And of course, the truth is that the the strongest defenders of or uh, opponents of QMV in in, uh, uh, in foreign policy were always the, the UK. I mean, do, do you think that there is actually a sign that constructive abstention uh, and the development of that idea is 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 beginning to break that down. Well, we, we've had constructive abstention for some time, but nobody wants to use it. <laughs> no, yeah. nobody's willing to see you know big serious foreign policy decisions being made, and 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 people assign themselves to the to the outer reaches of that. Um, we we still have the ongoing conversation about QMV in the area of foreign security defense policy. I have to say, I don't see the reality of that. I don't see member states allowing themselves to be outvoted on issues which impinge on national identity and national security and national defense in any substantial way. Um, 
And you know, even when we have QMV in areas like agriculture, energy, transport, the member states go to extraordinary lengths to avoid the, the use of qualified majority voting. So I, I just don't see it on the horizon. I do see a lot of, I do have some sympathy for the, for the German position and even for, for, for Macron's position to say, you know, we really do need to have a conversation about, you know, what are the shared security threats that we have? Um, but we always fall down on, on their prioritization. You know, if you're if you're in Latvia and if you're in Cyprus, your vision of the, your view of the world is profoundly different. And coming up with a prioritized list of security threats and devoting your resources to those priorities necessarily means that some things are priorities and some things aren't. And and that will continue to be problematic, I think, for the European Union going forward. That's why, in brief, I think there's a problem in our looking at the European Union in the way we look at the United States. Russia or China. The European Union, it's not in the Union's DNA to be a decisive foreign policy, security policy actor. It simply isn't in our DNA. And I think we have to think more creatively about the Union's role in the world than trying to replicate in the European Union the kinds of structures we see in member states. Thanks. Uh, Federico, is there anybody else out there asking questions? Yes, uh, Dermot Hayes has uh, his microphone uh, going. So Dermot. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for taking the question. Um, I just, I, I think it's interesting what Ben there was saying about um, especially France's um, projects in, in northern Mali. And I think why there's often an appetite to talk about doing more in this area, doing more, doing more, when a decision to, to actually do more is taken, as in Mali, like there's not much follow up or more, much discussion in um, foreign, foreign, foreign policy circles. Yeah, I think that is something that, that, that the union itself has to deal with. Um, I mean, when, when, you, when you see the way in which union missions and operations are constructed, um, you know, it, it is sort of not even metaphorically, but literally a case of, you know, OK, we all want to send, you know, 3000 troops to country X on such and such a peacekeeping or peacemaking mission, you know, hands up now who wants to provide the troops um, and very, very few hands go up uh, and very few people are willing to put their hands in their pocket. That's why I think these new, these new structures the Union has agreed in, through the European Peace Fund, for example, for the direct funding of, of peacekeeping operations out of a central budget uh, and, and, and taking the burden off the national finance ministries, I think that could be significant going forward. But nonetheless, I, I come back to the point, you know, the member states have got to come up with, the, with, with, with an agreed assessment of what the security threats are, what the responses to those threats should be, and how to prioritize those threats. And, and we are still some distance from that kind of structure and that kind of shared understanding. Um, and that really is endemic to the very nature of the European Union as a, as a global actor. Paddy, I think both John Doyle and uh, uh, Rui Pinto had questions also. Okay. Okay, John. Um, I suppose that Eduardo, um, I mean, Ireland's put a big focus on, on um, data centres in recent years. This morning's news again in terms of what potentially down in arc load, a lot of discussion around the climate change issues around that energy usage. But parking that issue, if this is a big focus of industrial strategy uh, for Ireland, are there Brexit dimensions to the inevitable cross-border um, in and out of the EU use of that sort of data in a post-Brexit world? Can we take Rui's question as well, as I see him uh, finally able to speak there? Hi, Rui. Okay. Please. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the magnificent uh, event. My question is just this um, new framework this is in discussing now in the academic uh, uh, environment also about these uh, differences uh, integrations. This is a framework to... Um, to speed the, the agreements uh, in different uh, uh, life. Um, for example, in the EU, where we have a different culture and different uh, minds of set to, um, to tackle um, different issues. And this framework uh, tried to speed this uh, to, um, to, to have less uh, uh, less uh, uh, po uh, less groups 
or less people to to discuss in the different issues. Um, I, I would like to to uh, to ask what is your point of view about this framework? Is is uh, achieve some um, effectivity or, or not? This is just. If I may start uh, to address uh, uh, John question. Uh, many thanks, John, for this question. Is it, is it indeed very relevant? So the uh, Ireland has the opportunity now to really foster and to improve, to enhance uh, its position as the leading digital hub in Europe. As you said, there is a great potential now for locating even more data centers and servers uh, in Ireland because of its uh, geographical uh, location and climate. The main uh, problem from a data protection and Brexit perspective is uh, um, how Ireland, uh, the possibility that Ireland has uh, now to um, somehow detach its economy, which is uh, um, deeply integrated with uh, the UK economy and therefore achieve a sort of like separation from really from a technical perspective. So the big problem is, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, it, the TCA uh, provides for a clause that establishes a mutual commitment not to adopt uh, data localization clauses. So data localization is essentially the requirements that um, whereby states can ask uh, data controllers to store physically data within their jurisdiction. So according to the TCA, both parties shall not adopt such clauses. And these will be essential, especially in the fields of non-personal data exchange, which is of course not covered by the GDPR. The big problem of, of the Irish economy, tech economy, is that so far has been really much integrated with the UK economy. So the problem now of the uh, free uh, transfer, free flow of data is that if an adequacy determination will not be achieved, uh, Ireland, in order to uh, really exploit this potential of having like data centers in Ireland and really being uh, becoming the main uh, digital hub in Europe, uh, will have to um, uh, reverse this process of outsourcing services to the UK and become fully independent from a, a data uh, protection perspective. Ben, do you want to? Yeah, ju just in terms of, of Rui's question on, on you know, to, to what extent do, do frameworks actually pull the member states together and sort of minimize the differences? I think in the area of foreign policy, there's, there's always been this debate on, on which comes first. Does the political will come first to create the institutions or do the institutions create the political will? Um, and I think you've seen a dynamic over time. And again, if you go back 50 years and see where we started in foreign security defense policy, we've come an enormous distance uh, in that space of time to the point at which, you know, with the European Defense Fund, with some of the proposals on the table for, for defense coordination and budgetary coordination, the European Union has a potential to have the capacity to be a decisive actor on the global stage. But again, I, and I come back to the point that that has not yet overridden or, or undermined or in any way you know, really, really torn the edges off the profound differences in national approach, national strategic planning, national sense of, of what is a threat, what is not a threat um, to allow us to come together. I mean, remember, we don't even defend our own borders <laughs> as a European Union. There's no guarantee to defend one another uh, in the treaties beyond vague assurances, which are almost immediately qualified. You know, we're, we're not as strong as NATO in terms of territorial defense. Now, there are many areas in which we have advantages over NATO when we do much more than, than NATO, but you still have this profound issue of, of the Union being a very innovative kind of policy, which has not yet developed to the point at which you can seriously talk about it as being a sovereign. Um, and here's where I would criticize, you know, actors such as, such as uh, uh, President Macron, you know, to talk in terms of strategic autonomy, to talk in terms of European sovereignty. 
really puts the target, puts the headline too far ahead of where, where the reality is. Um, and notwithstanding his efforts in the European Security Council and the European Intervention Initiative, uh, I, I, I do believe that, that, setting, that setting the European Union up um, as with the goal of having you know, a decisive military capacity to be wielded overseas at short notice and in strength simply sets the European Union up for failure. It, it's not, as I say again, it's not within our DNA to act in that way. It may be in the future with some kind of political federation and, and, and decision on a, on a sovereign European Union, but we are some, some distance away from that, I think. Right, any more questions? Any more questions? I don't think there are more any more questions, Patty, so probably we can close the panel a few minutes, just a few minutes ahead of time. Okay. Uh, well, listen, thank you all for, for contributing. I see that we have at the moment 65 participants, uh, which is a, a healthy uh, uh, audience. And uh, I want to thank uh, Ben Conrad and uh, Eduardo Celeste for their, for their contributions and the uh, Institute for, for hosting this discussion. So thank you all very much. And if I can follow up, uh, Paddy, thank you also very warmly for uh, chairing uh, this panel. Let me echo what you said and, and thank Ben uh, and Eduardo for their presentation. I should have mentioned, actually, I think I forgot to say it at the very start that originally the panel was meant to have three speakers, uh, Oliver Garner from the British Institute uh, uh, of International and Comparative Law, uh, was due to uh, present on internal security, so EU-UK cooperation in the area of freedom and security and justice. And just to reassure everyone, uh, he will be contributing uh, to the final book. Uh, he already wrote a chapter actually on, on that specific topic. Unfortunately, due to medical reasons, he couldn't join us uh, this morning. So we had a, a shorter panel, but um, Certainly, the topics that we addressed in the morning uh, were uh, were really quite crucial uh, in uh, defining.